Karin for a kind introduction, for invitation to give this lecture, for all what you do for organizing the summer school and the rest, five weeks. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. It's my second time, I think, and it's always a nice environment. We now discovered all of you. It's, it's, it's very pleasant here. So uh, as for the talk, mm, so uh, Initially, I thought, uh, okay, I will try to uh, um, use some of the talks I've given in the past, and I finished to do something new. Well, the motivation was that I thought that probably m many of you don't really know much about a posterior estimates and uh, what is it, what is it good for, and uh, so I thought that uh, it would be a good idea to try to give you like an overview uh, presentation. So you will take me later on if, if, if I if was able to succeed at least a little bit. And basically all I'm presenting, at the end of the talk, there will be a list of uh, scientific papers. And so I've listed all the co-authors. So you see in science, this very often collaborative work. OK, so I would like first to make an introduction, hopefully, that everyone can understand. And we'll see later on what will be the content of the talk. So. When you do numerical simulation of partial differential equations, very, very soon, you are still in your master studies, you do your first attempt to see what is behind these subjects. And at some point, you program. When you program, you are in the discrete world. So it means that you uh, live in some finite dimension, in some n-dimensional space, and you are facing the following question. How do I find an approximate solution to a problem a of u equals f, where f is a given vector, so an n-dimensional uh, algebraic vector. u is another vector that you look for, and a is a nonlinear operator. So you've got a system of algebraic equations. The number of the equation is this capital N, but they are not linear system, so it's not two by two or n by n linear system, but the system is nonlinear. Okay? So, how do you solve it? I think the most popular approach is what uh, I think uh, properly would be called inexact iterative linearization. So, what does it mean? This word iterative means that there will be some iterative procedure. So, you take some index that will describe the step of the iteration. So the index is called k here. You choose some initial vector. So this u0 is algebraic vector of dimension n. And out of it, you start to iterate. How do you proceed typically in this iteration? Well, you consider this your first approximate solution. So you use it to uh, try to build out of this nonlinear operator a matrix, it means linear operator, n by n matrix, and uh, solve at this given step, at least approximately, the system of linear algebraic equations. So this means a matrix of dimension n times n. This is a right-hand side, which is also constructed out of what you have at your disposal, this current approximation, and you look for a new update. And hopefully, this procedure at the end will give you a true or at least approximate solution to this u that you look for here. But this is just half of the problem, because now you have a big system of linear algebraic equations. And you've discovered here, big means usually not 10 by 10, not 100 by 100, but rather million by million, or even uh, some more uh, digits in the power of the number. Okay. So you typically cannot do it exactly. So you don't really, are, you're not really able to find this vector. So that's why are these signs here, at least approximately, you try to solve this uh, system of linear algebraic equations. Well, how do you do so? Very often, and you've seen talks about it, you take some 
other inner loop where you take another starting vector. Typically, you start from what you have. You take another index, index i, which will be for the inner loop, for a linear algebra loop, and you solve this system iteratively by some iterative algebraic solver. Okay? There are many of them, and this is doable now. You go to MATLAB, and you choose CG or GMRS or whatever, and, and you just call uh, the procedure. Okay? So what does the procedure do for you? The procedure, the given algorithm, finds you on the current step i, out of the information you had as your starting guess, a current approximate that in my setting has two indices, k because remember you are on the step k of your linearization, you are now on step i of your linear algebra, and this approximate vector solves, at least approximately, this system of equations, so it should solve it with equality, and typically it's not with equality, you miss something, this is what you miss, you know, this is the algebraic residual vector, and this is the information you have on a step i of your linear algebraic solver. So this you have when you would go to MATLAB and let him compute uh, by any iterative method, you have all these objects. You will have this approximate vector in particular. And then there are two questions, I'd say only, but in fact they are very much important. So you need to check whether in this inner loop everything is fine in terms that you admit that this object, UKI, approximates to a correct precision this one that you looked for, this UK. So you've got some convergence criterion. If it's okay, you stop. If not, you just continue this in loop. And of course, you've got another convergence criterion for the R2 loop. So once again, you need to have something to verify whether these objects that you get, this UK, are sufficiently close to this one which is here. So, I believe this is really uh, something which is very, very common to all of you. And now, what is more precisely the context I'm interested in? So the context is not that this vector UKI would be something that I'm happy with. This UKI for me is just some algebraic vector, typically of degrees of freedom, which represents some approximate solution that I call basically the same but lowercase, and index h means some numerical approximate solution. Some numerical approximate solution of some partial differential equation. Okay? So not only that this algebraic vector that you obtain, it does not solve the original system of nonlinear algebraic equations, but the approximation that you get out of it is probably far from this object, which is the one that you are interested in at the very end. You're not really interested in this solution of this equation. What you are interested in is your solution of this equation of the nonlinear PDE. Okay? So this raises some number of questions, and those that I would be interested in in this talk, and I'll try to show you what can be done, are these two types. So first, very practical ones. So I've got this iterative procedure with outer loop and inner loop. And very practical, when do I stop the inner loop and when do I stop the outer loop? First two types of questions. Because, okay, if I go these two slides back, it is quite clear that with rounding errors, you can iterate here to infinity. I mean, even if on paper the, the algorithm should stop at the dimension of the problem, uh, you may iterate to infinity. And the same thing for the nonlinear. So you need to decide at some point that it is enough. So when is it when it's enough? And the second kind of questions I'll be asking are very much related to this context, which I do believe is crucial to, to have always in your mind. So once again, you are not really interested in the question how far this vector is from the u vector which solved this problem. The real question you are asking is how far your approximate numerical solution that you obtain on a given step k of some iterative linearization procedure, I put Newton because typically linearization is done by Newton, 
and on step i of your linear algebra. So the question is how far this function is from this function, which is the true unknown solution of your PDE. Okay. Okay. And this is a typical something which can be done, and you will see in the talk with a posterior estimates. Estimate the error between known typically piecewise polynomial or numerical approximation and unknown function solution of some partial differential equation. Okay? And to finish, so this is just a number. So if we can estimate it, it's pretty good. But we actually want always more. We want to see how in your simulation domain you are far from the solution in each, say, element, etc. So this is something I call distribution of the error. Not just the error as a number, but the distribution. Okay. So, so in what will be the rest of the talk? In part two, I will just start from a linear problem to show you how estimates of this form can be done for a linear problem, for linear partial differential equation. In part three, I will add an iterative algebraic solver, and we will see how uh, this estimates can be done whenever you solve linear PDE and you have some iterative algebraic solver. It's only in part four that I come back to this motivation. So well, I have nonlinear problem, iterative linearization, and linear algebra. And in part five, I hope to show you uh, I would say extension of three academic cases which are here to something much more uh, uh, necessary in, in, in practice. Okay. So hopefully we will go up to there. I always start slowly in the beginning, so I apologize, but I will be speeding up from, from this moment on. So let's look on the linear case. So my linear model toy problem is the Laplace equation. So minus Laplacian of u equals f, u is zero on the boundary. We are in two or three space dimensions. Omega, for simplicity, is just polygon or polyhedron. And the source term function, I'm not a mathematician, is an L2 object. So everyone knows this. This partial differential equation can be very precisely described in terms of mathematical language of Sobolev spaces. So you take that one, which is called H10. Your weak solution is a function sitting in this space such that this integral equality is satisfied for all test functions. The advantage, you've got proper setting, existence, and uniqueness of the solution in these types of spaces. Now, this mathematical setting uh, is actually very close to where your physics started in, and this is these four lines. So, this object U, which you can think of pressure or temperature or something like this, the primal variable, by my definition sits in this H10 space, and it's actually a constraint. We only look for pressures or uh, temperatures which are setting in these types of spaces, mathematically. They are continuous in the sense of traces. You don't want the temperature to be 5 degrees here and minus 10 just next to it. When you make another object out of U, the dual variable via physics constitutive relation, so in my Laplace case, it's just the flux is minus gradient of u. You can formulate two other properties. First of all, the divergence and weak divergence of sigma equals f. Well, this is basically what was written here. That's the physical law of equilibrium. And there is a second constraint, a constraint for the dual variable, second property which comes from physics. These dual objects, these fluxes, uh, velocities, stresses, what you wish, these are objects which physically also have some continuity in it, and the continuity is mathematically described by the space. So, is it possible to write on the? Yeah, it should be possible to write on the. Uh, on the so, just to, to give you a very simple uh, example. So, for my Laplace problem, if I, for instance, make a line inside of my domain omega, it will never happen to me that this object, this flux, is something which would be like this. You know, if, if the flux is your water, underground water velocity, the velocity will never flow like this. You agree? Because what flows out of this domain is definitely not equal what flows in the second domain. So this age diff constraint actually means that you have some kind of continuity, and the continuity 
is, in fact, just that the normal component of these objects is the same. So sigma dot n on this left subdomain equals sigma dot n if you speak about sigma on this right subdomain and this equality holds on this interface gamma, okay? So this is the continuity of this second variable, the dual variable, and this is mathematically described by this H diff space. So this is what goes on on the level of the PDE. Okay, now let's start to think first of a solution, say, that you obtain with your favorite numerical method, finite elements, finite volumes, without any error from linear algebra. Well, this is typically a piecewise polynomial, but definitely a function which is H1 element by mesh element, so living in this space. But in many methods, this object does not satisfy at least one of these two constraints which are written here. And in some methods, like DG, it satisfies none of them. So in DG, typically, UH is not a continuous object, and its flux is not sitting in the correct space. So this is why, in the way we do a posterior analysis, we introduce two objects which will help us to say how big is the error between this and this. And these two objects, they just go for the correct continuity. So the first one is a scalar, sits in H10 space, and the second one is a vector, and as a function, it sits in this H div space and needs to satisfy this weak form of the divergence constraint of the equilibrium. Now, I've put this in a form of a theorem. So what is the theorem saying? It says that under these assumptions, so for your weak solution, arbitrary approximation, and if you have these two types of objects, then actually I can give an answer on the question, how big is the error between this unknown weak solution of a PDE and known numerical approximation? It is less than or equal to, when you put the square here, then a sum of three types of, of uh, fully computable quantities. These quantities are called a posteriori estimates, and these quantities are only constructed out of what you know, which is this approximate solution UH, this first reconstructed object sigma H, it's also just sigma H and the datum, and you see this one once again, UH and SH. So what is on the right you know, what is on the left you don't know, and this is the a posteriori error estimate. You estimate the unknown error via something computable. Well, I've put the proof of this theorem to uh, do a little bit of mathematics. So if you wish, there will be two slides, and you will learn how, uh, you, hopefully I will persuade you that this is really true. So how does the story go? First of all, you take your object UH, which is not necessarily sitting in the good space, and you project it into the good space, which is this line here. Then because this S is a projection, well, the Pythagoras equality gives you that the distance of UH to U square is the sum of these two squares. Well, still because this S is a projection, it's the object which is the closest in this H0 space to this UH, so that's why it's the minimizer of this. So actually, this term is nothing but mathematical writing of how far UH is from the correct space. So this is the distance of UH to your correct space. Well, and then if you look, okay, okay. Yeah, if, you, if you look on this second uh, object here, well, it's grad U minus S, well, by dual norm characterization, this is nothing but a supremum over test functions from your space, test in, in, in the energy norm equal to one of this, but grad S, grad V for any object in H10, grad S, grad phi here, well, it's, that's where you can plug in back the UH, and then this object written like this has its own uh, name, and then the name is dual norm of the residual. This is basically how far this object UH is from satisfying the PDE. So how far UH is from the correct space and how far UH is from satisfying the PDE are the two numbers. When you sum them in squares, you get the distance in terms of energy. So this is preparatory work. Now I show you how I estimate this and this object. So the first one is particularly easy. 
So minimum over H10 functions of the energy distance of UH to V. Well, you can upper bound by any object in H10. So I take my object that I prepared in the announcement of my theorem, and this is it. And for the other one, it's not too complicated either. So the other one, remember, it had some form of supremum of this kind of numbers. So I just take this number and study what is it. So this number equals to this one by the definition of your weak solution. Then we plug in the flux object, the sigma h. We use the green theorem, so basically this, and this is the same. That's why I put it there. I changed nothing, it's still equal. Then, and then I look at these two terms separately. So this one is easier. This you can write as the sum of integrals over mesh elements, and then you just use Cauchy-Schwarz to take L2 norm of this, L2 norm of this. And the other one, well, this is still equal to this norm. And I've avoided a space here because my condition I've imposed on sigma h allows me to subtract here the mean value of my test function. And then if I use a Poincaré, first Cauchy-Schwarz, L2 of this, L2 of this, and then Poincaré, I come to a form where I only see my estimators that you've seen before, computable numbers, and the norm of the test function phi. So remember that the test function phi is scaled to one, so that's why you can get rid of it, and the theorem is proven by another Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay? Well, so these two objects, this SH and sigma H, we typically call them the first one the potential, and the second one the flux reconstruction. We've seen how the upper bound looks like, and from there it's clear that the best objects you could get would be those which minimize your estimators. So the minimizer, say in some discrete subspace of H10 of this, would be the best guy in the upper bound. And also a minimizer in some correct subspace of H of omega of the second term, where say we impose that the divergence is what it should be, so constraint minimization, that would be the best guy for my first term. Well, so this looks great, but there's a big problem. So to solve these two equations, you would pay more than what you pay to get your UH, and this is what you don't want to do. So it's too expensive because these minimizations are global. So that's why in aposteric analysis, and this is read recently, they appeared several recipes how to do something like this, but for applies of just some local problems, not the global one. Okay, so that's the next slide. You may see that the form of this minimization is more or less the same as on the previous slide. What changes is that you just only take one patch, so you take one mesh vertex, all the elements which share the vertex, this is called patch omega A, and you do some kind of a minimization only on the patch, and you obtain an object, a vector, uh, with index A only in the patch, and similarly, for the primal variable, you do some minimization only in the patch. Well, it turns out that these two definitions, as they are written, they can be, okay, they are, they are expressions of the fact that on these little subdomains of your domain, you solve some problem by conforming finite elements, this is for this one, and by mixed finite elements, and this is for this one, okay? So now such a procedure is extremely cheap. It gives you these two objects. What is left to do, you just run over all mesh matrices, sum up, and you obtain two candidates, which will, as you will see at least from numerics, and uh, a little bit of theory I'll show you, a good candidates for my upper bound. So I did everything only locally, and okay, details I have no time to explain. A big role is played by this function here, which is the head function, piecewise affine function, which takes value here, value one here, and zero everywhere else. Okay, so just believe me that these two objects are okay, they can be used in the upper bound. To show you a little bit what's going on, so say if your UH comes from DG, it can be something like this, it's discontinuous, and this SH is something like this, and say if your original flux has a jumping normal component across the mesh faces, what you obtain as a flux equilibration, as explained here, is some vector field which is not jumping anymore. So, a little bit more of a theory, what you can prove in theory. 
So uh, to characterize some theoretical properties, I will need these two objects here, which are basically nothing but what you've seen before, but now written not in some continuous, not in some discrete finite element spaces, but written in finite dimensional, unfinite dimensional spaces, H diff on the patch and H10 on the patch. And there is a lot of mathematics to show the following things under three assumptions, which are just maybe list here, maybe I don't know this too much. So there are some assumptions which are rather easy to satisfy. And under these assumptions, you can prove, and to prove this, this is like hundreds of pages, it's absolutely non-trivial, you can prove the following properties. So the discrete objects that you obtain in your, in your uh, computer, computer code, which give you these computable numbers, are in fact sitting below the numbers that you obtained if you, uh, which are defined with these continuous pro, uh, objects, sigma a and s a. So this number is less than or equal to up to a number that is a stability constant, and the number only depends on the shape regularity of your mesh. Once again, long proof of such, such, a, such, a, um, such a property. So this is the first step towards concluding the circle. What is the circle? We already know that these objects are upper bound for the error, and now, in the next step, I'm able to prove out of this that these computable estimators are also lower bound for the error. You see u minus uh, there is no u here, no u here. Now it pops up again here. And I see that my computable objects are not only upper bounding the error, but locally in each patch, they are also lower bounding the error. There is this constant which comes from here, and there is one more which comes from little few more pages of mathematics. So uh, it closes the, the circle. I know that these objects are upper bound and they are also lower bound up to these numbers. And a side remark is that we can we know from theory of mathematics what is the um, what is the upper bound on these numbers. So I think it's fine enough for uh, for proofs in mathematics. And uh, we'll now uh, go through how does this can be applied in practice, and there will be quite some pictures. So hopefully this will this will wake you up. Okay. So first, how this abstract theory can be applied. So let us take the method that every one of knows, every one of you knows, conforming finite elements. So you take some finite dimensional subspace of H10, piecewise polynomials on each mesh element of degree p, and you define your method in this way. This gives you a very precise notion of UH, of what UH is, and we've seen some uh, rather powerful mathematical results which hold true under three assumptions. So this slide is just to show you that it's immediate to check that these three assumptions hold true for this particular method, the conforming finite elements. Okay? First assumption was some Galerkin orthogonality. This is this line here, when you take a test function, that one. Well, in fact, assumption B is not really needed. We are not non-conforming, so we can take SH equal UH, and assumption C was some technical stuff which can always be satisfied. So here have one example of a method which satisfies all of what I've shown you. Another example is so-called non-conforming finite element method. Well, it writes in basically the same way as this one. What is different that now, this is a true example of a numerical method which gives you approximation UH, which is not inside of your energy space H10. So these are still piecewise polynomials, but they are not completely continuous. They are weakly continuous in the sense that the jumps, which is this, which is written here, have some orthogonality property. Well, and you've got ABC to satisfy, C is always okay, there's no problem. A is a Galerkin orthogonality, this is trivial, and assumption B was kind of what the jumps need to satisfy, and this is exactly uh, 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 satisfied by this line here. So this is another method which perfectly fits into the framework. Well, and I had a third one, I probably just skip it. So another method, mixed finite elements, which perfectly fit into the framework. So I promised you pictures and numbers, so they are coming here. So how does all of this behave in practice. So 
uh, we're still in our model problem. We take a situation where we know the true solution, and of course this is the easy one to start with, and now we pick one particular method to discretize this PDE, and it will be a method which I haven't shown you. It's so-called discontinuous Garkin method, and it's a symmetric version. And I show you a big table. So there are a lot of numbers there. Well, what are the numbers? I refine my mesh, so I start from some given mesh, and I always cut all the triangles into four smaller ones. I also increase the polynomial degree, and then I monitor what is this energy error, the distance of u to uh, and I show you what are these different estimators that we've seen. Uh, when I sum them in the with the squares, I get my overall estimate, and the number that we are, we are most interested in is just the ratio of this over this. We know from theory that it has to be greater than or equal than one, and we check in numerics how is it. So it's greater than or equal one indeed. It does not deteriorate when you increase the polynomial degree. This is what you have proven. And on top of it, what we've proven, we've got something which we just observed numerically, and this is so-called assumptive exactness. Actually, my estimators approximate the true error. So the ratio estimator over error goes to one. See, when you increase both, when you increase polynomial degree or when you refine your mesh, they just turn to one. So this is the assumptive exactness. See? So a little bit more fancy example. We're still in Laplace setting, but we take the L-shaped domain, so something which looks like this. In this case, the true solution is not anymore a smooth, uh, easy, uh, 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 true solution, but this is something which is a singularity. Now, to approximate it, we still use this DG, another variant, the incomplete variant, and we not refine anymore the grids in the same way everywhere, but we start to use these estimators. How do we use them? We look where the error is big. Where the error is big, there we refine the mesh. But we also look whether if we go to higher polynomial degree, it will help us or not. So we refine both mesh and polynomial degree, and this is what is called HP adaptive refinement. There is one miracle which can be obtained with HP adaptive refinement, and the miracle is kind of seen in this plot. The miracle is best appreciated if you compare this curve with the other ones. This curve shows you how the error, so grad u minus uh, decreases in terms of degrees of freedom whenever you just do H refinement. Fix some polynomial degree and you do H refinement. Well, it goes quite fast down to zero, but definitely not as fast as these curves when you do both H and P refinement. Well, the property of HP refinement is that it allows you to obtain so-called exponential convergence, which is here. In terms of the number of degrees of freedom, the energy error goes down to zero with exponential speed. This is known from a priori analysis, and what this graph shows you that even if you don't know a priori what is the situation, you just use these estimators, you refine your mesh in H and polynomial degree in P following the estimators, you also obtain the correct slope of the error, the uh, HP refine. Well, and basically the third plot is, once again, the effectivity index, ratio estimator over the error, and uh, the two curves, which are for our estimators, is this one and this one. In H adaptivity, you see you get something like 1.2, and in HP, uh, you even go below 1.2. So you overestimate the error at most by, say, 20% which I think is rather good. Okay, last uh, plot. So I've promised, I've described in words what's going on. So the singularity is here. What happens when I go in my procedure on and on? I refine the mesh towards the singularity. So this is a 10 times zoom. So you see, uh, if you zoom, it's refined. And this, you don't really appreciate what's inside. And even on the zoom, you don't really appreciate. So you refine very much in H towards the singularity. And outside of this region where the solution is singular, where you typically keep just a quite low polynomial degree, you see that the polynomial degree as you go out of this corner 
increases, so we went up to something like seven here. So this is this HP adaptivity. So this was how far UH is from U when you suppose that UH is solved exactly. So the next part, I solve for UH with some iterative algebraic algorithm, and I don't let the algorithm to go to infinity. So I want to take into account the algebraic error. So this is the setting once again. This is my finite elements. P degree we've seen just now. Finite elements degree P, S, uh, other methods that you know, finite difference, finite volume, generate a system of linear algebraic equations, which looks like this, matrix, vector, and unknown algebraic vector. You pick your favorite algebraic solver, you iterate, on each step you obtain approximate solution UHI, where this residual is known, and you want to know, as explained in the introduction, not really how far this vector is from this vector, but how far approximate solution corresponding to this is to you. So to develop this notation, uh, is this UHI object, which will be interesting for us. We did first one little thing. So we take this algebraic vector and we introduce its representer. So this is algebraic vector and we want to find a typically piecewise polynomial function, so we go from uppercase to lowercase, which you now uh, approximates in this, or um, fixes it in this sense, and then this line written in numerical algebra language can be written in language of numerical methods of PDEs in this way. So my UHI, the piecewise polynomial function, is an exact solution of what it should be up to the residual, which is some other piecewise polynomial function, okay? So this is the setting, and then I want to estimate the algebraic error. To do so, I will be heavily using the fact that when I subtract this equation from this one, I obtain that UH, the true finite element solution that I never get, the one that I get on step I of my favorite iterative solver, they are just linked to this residual. Okay. So, the first result is as follows. If I ask the question how far UHI is from UH, so the approximate solution on step I from the true solution of finite elements, I can show a bound on this number, and this bound can be obtained, as we've seen in the first case, also in terms of some vector object sitting in this HDiv space. The only condition I need that this object sitting in HDiv has its divergence equal to this representative of the algebraic residual. So this is, this is the proof of this result. So grad UH minus UHI, once again, dual norm. This is equal to this, supremum of some finite dimensional functions scaled in energy norm to one and then this object equals to this, we've seen on the previous slide, and then as seen before, I just plug in the divergence of sigma HA, which is here equal to RHA, by Green theorem, I obtain that this is equal to this, and then just Cauchy Schwarz tells me that this is the upper bound. So in other words, whenever I'm able to construct an object which is typically a piecewise polynomial vector, such that its divergence is this number, I'm done, I can bound the algebraic error. Well, but this is of course the problem. There have been some proposition in the past. Uh, what is in green in my talk is always like, we are not completely happy. So I will only show you this option three on the next slide. I will show you how via multi-level algorithm I can obtain a vector field which completely exactly lips the algebraic residual and then we know it will give us an upper bound on the algebraic error. So this is the way to proceed. I need to go into multi-level setting, so I take some big patch, and there actually is, is some sub-mesh of it, but you see nothing, so that's a pity. Uh, and on these bigger patches, where inside there's one layer of mesh elements, so multi-level setting hidden, you, as we've seen before in our approach, you solve some little local problem. The local problem is written here, and it basically gives you 
some coarse grid reads representer of your algebraic residual. Whenever you have such an object, you can basically mimic what we've seen before. You stay on this patch and you solve some constraint minimization that corresponds to a mixed finite element problem. And this gives you some vector uh, polynomial in each component associated with the vertex i. And then when you run over all vertices, you get an object which can be proven, and this is this line here, to be such that it's divergent is RHI. So in basically the same spirit as we've seen for the Laplace equation and the discretization error, sitting on some local patches, it is possible to obtain what we need here, piecewise vector polynomial such, it's, such that its divergence is the algebraic vector, and consequently we can bound the algebraic error from above. Well, and this was just to show you that it's also possible to bound the algebraic error from below, but I just probably skip it. It's also some procedure on, on, a, on a patch, and the result is that algebraic error can also be bounded from, from below. But I will don't go to the details. So, this is the algebraic error. Now let's now see how this part of what we're developing works in practice. So once again, some toy problem. This time with still some you know, uh, uh, high gradient zone. So it's a peak problem, so it looks like this. It's a bump inside of the domain. And the L shape we've seen before. This time we discretize with conforming finite elements. Once again, we test what's going on for increasing polynomial degrees. And uh, this time we just stay on uniformly refined meshes. Uh, we are in the two settings of algebraic solver. I'm showing you results for two different solvers. The multigrid, multigrid V-cycle with five pre-smoothing steps of Gauss-Seidel. And conjugate gradients where you precondition in MATLAB with uh, drop-off tolerance uh, Koleski. So what is it giving us in practice? So now these tables are in terms of iterations of your algebraic solver. So this first table is for multigrid, I iterate. You see that on uh, <coughs> uh, lower polynomial degrees, when the systems are smaller, I converge rather fast. And here I need uh, up to 13 iterations to converge. And what these tables are importantly for us once again showing is that how our estimates on the algebraic error this time behave. So our upper bound divided by the true error is this number, and this is effectivity of our algebraic upper bound, and our lower bound is here. So you see these two numbers are pretty fine. Their effectivity in this is very close to one. This is for what goes back to my introduction. So I've been speaking on how to estimate the algebraic error but bear in mind, you're always interested also how far your UHI is from the true solution of the PDE. And this is this here. So you see, once again, up to 5 to 20%, you know how far you are from the true solution. And this one is just the last error, the discretization one. So this was for multigrid. How does it work? And this is how does it work for preconditioned conjugate gradients. Once again, up to this column, I believe, typically, uh, effectivity in this is very, very close to the optimal value of 1, 4. The total error, once again discussed in the introduction, and its two components, algebraic and discretization. Last but not least, I've mentioned in the introduction, you're always interested in see how the error is distributed in space. This is the L-shape problem. We've seen that there is a big problem here. So not surprisingly, the estimators for the total error tell us that the biggest total error is concentrated around here. And indeed, if we compare with what is the answer on the question, how the error is distributed, these two pictures match pretty nicely. See, we estimate this 5.5, this is 4.5. So overestimate a little, but not much. But interesting picture is the following one, at least for me. So even if the big issue of the model problem is here in the corner. It's not the case for linear algebra. So the distribution of the linear algebra error, this is for the PCG, is completely not concerned about what's going on here. The biggest algebraic error appears somewhere here in this extremity. 
So in other words, uh, the usual approach where you just say, okay, I need to have the algebraic error small, and that's it, it's not 100% sure. You should probably also ask yourself a question how the algebraic error is distributed, and check that these numbers, which are rather big here, don't spoil you your accuracy here. Well, anyway, this is what we predict for the distribution of the algebraic error, and this is what is the true distribution of the algebraic error. So, with this I'm done with one example of um, how the algebraic component can be estimated. And I've included another one, so this corresponds to work and PhD thesis of Sarah, who was sitting in the back, so she did all the experiments for that part. And uh, basically it's the same as I've just presented now, but we switched to solver. The solver is now a domain decomposition, so it's described here. We, in the numerical experiments I'm presenting, cut the domain into nine subdomains. We use the Schwarz domain decomposition algorithm with Robin transmission conditions. There's also another numerical method, this time lowers auto mixed finite elements. This is the model problem. It's not anymore Laplacian. There is some diffusion tensor which jumps a lot. And this is our exact solution. So, an issue which I have not really touched so far is that Whenever you, okay, I've touched it at the very beginning. When do we stop? Well, we've got an iterative algorithm, when do we stop? So I don't, did not really show you for my previous numerical experiments, so I'll show you here. Now we iterate with DD, and we need to also decide when do we stop. Well, but this is the criterion we are suggesting. Because we can always give an upper bound on the error, because we cut it into components, discretization, algebraic total, we can easily suggest the most uh, say natural criterion that comes to your mind. You will not iterate until the discretization DD, domain decomposition error, goes to 10 to the minus 10, but you only iterate until it's, say, 10 times smaller than the discretization error. So this will be seen in the plots which are coming. First of all, how does the total error look as a function of DD iterations. You see that the total error, this blue curve, decreases in, say, first 10 DD iterations and then completely stagnates. Well, this is because it's dominated by domain decomposition error here and dominated by discretization error here. In terms of total error, these are our estimates. You see they are bigger than the error and follow the same so this is just the effectivity index ratio of this over this, and probably more is seen here. So you see this total error went down and then started to stagnate. Well, this is because the discretization error is there, and you can never go down below the, with the total error below the discretization. And this is our estimator on the DD domain decomposition error. So. Here we are with our stopping criteria on the plot. What we are saying, we are saying that the domain decomposition error, so this green curve, should be just 10 times smaller, so somewhere here, than, say, this discretization or total error. There's no need to continue from this point onwards, so no need to continue from iteration 15 to iteration 100, because basically nothing is going on. So this is a practical suggestion now, first practical answer on the question I've been asking in the introduction, when do we stop? For the moment, just the inner loop, the linear algebra loop. And one last picture, so once again, we are interested in how the error is distributed. So the true error is distributed in this way, and then we have our three estimators, estimator for the total error, so you see matches quite nicely. Our estimator for the discretization error, so it matches quite nicely. So this is taken on the 20th DD iteration, so 20 is here, so you see at the moment when the domain decomposition is not dominating anymore, we can see that the domain decomposition is rather small and does not influence, so the domain decomposition plus discretization is total and the total looks more or less like discretization. So the DD is there 
along the interfaces, but only a little bit. Okay, so that was part three, and uh, we are making our way towards trying to give the answers on the question I've asked in my introduction. So now I take a nonlinear PDE. So in my second slide, I've got A of lowercase u equals f. This is now a very precise form of it. So the operator A is a divergence via a nonlinear flux function, sigma bar. If you want to have an example, it's here. So this nonlinear flux function takes as an argument the Euclidean norm of the gradient of the unknown object, takes it to the power p minus 2, and this number multiplies the usual gradient. So this is so-called p Laplacian. So this is a nonlinear partial differential equation. It's typically set in functional spaces which are not anymore h10. They are w1p0, so lp integrable functions with lp integrable weak derivatives. And there will be a, you know, the usual uh, dual exponent called q, and now f is not anymore in L2, it's in LQ. And here I just take it piecewise polynomial to, to simplify some number of, of points. So, which is nice, on PD analysis, weak solution is always written in the same way. Or you, or you change our functional spaces, but it looks all about in the same way. So, I'm recalling from my introduction what we are interested in. We are interested in some numerical approximation, including iterative linearization and iterative algebraic solvers, which on step K of, say, Newton or other iterative linearization and step I of your favorite linear algebra solver gives you an approximate solution, so typically a piecewise polynomial UHKI, which is possibly non-conforming, so not necessarily sitting in my energy space. Okay? And we, of course, want to estimate how far this guy is from this guy. So, to do so, well, I take a lot of uh, knowledge that well, I'm going to present it to you. I can say I take a lot of knowledge for what I've learned from the first case, the linear one, and the second one where I just studied the algebraic error. And I still try to construct some discrete objects which will mimic the continuous ones, in particular, a flux function, sigma hki, which will still be sitting in the correct H diff space. So now it's uh, L2 vector functions, LQ, with weak divergence in LQ, which is this HQ diff space. And still, as in, the, as in the first case I've shown you, I want that this guy, and typically, if possible, on each uh, linearization and linear algebra step, equals to F. We've seen that we can do it in without linear solver, and we've seen we can also do it with linear solver to obtain something like this. Well, if you are able to do so, what we admit, we admit that there is some, some little number, some misfit out of it, and if we control this misfit, we can still, still proceed. Well, the important point is here. So, in the context of a problem where I will have discretization, linearization, and algebraic errors, I will be trying to take this one flux function and cut it into three pieces. A one which will, you see here, represent the linearization error. So in particle, as the linear solver converges, it will go to zero. Another one which on convergence will be small as well, which will represent the algebraic error. error. So we've seen that object before, the object which goes to zero whenever your algebraic solver converges. And of course, this one, which will then maintain the main part of the information. So, what is quite easily doable is the answer on the complete question I've asked on slide two. How far is UHKI from U? If you have these two assumptions satisfied, the distance of UHKI to U can be upper bounded by fully computable estimators, which moreover, so this is how big is the error, and the estimators are moreover cut into pieces that one which will always be there, that one which disappears when your linearization error is small, and that one which disappears when your algebra error is small. So I can control the overall error. Moreover, because I cut this upper bound into these pieces, I can very easily be also able to answer the question, when do I stop? Well, it's now trivial. 
I stop my uh, algebraic error whenever the algebraic uh, uh, component is not too big in comparison with the other ones, so discretization and linearization, and I stop the linearization whenever this component is not too big in comparison with discretization. Okay. In multigrid methods, typically this one is zero, so this line is always satisfied, and otherwise you just control this row object via this. Well, important mathematical property, and this is another uh, line which indeed has behind uh, tens of pages of proofs, is that not only that these objects are an upper bound on the error, but once again, vice versa, we can prove that these computable estimators are also a lower bound for the error up to some constant. And in this particular setting, which is extremely important, that this generic constant is independent of the size of the nonlinearity of the problem, which means independent of this nonlinear function sigma bar and of this Lebesgue exponent q. Well, there's one node. These criteria, there is one number uh, representing the linearization error in the whole mesh. You can very easily just satisfy these kind of inequalities mesh element by mesh element. This gives you local stopping criteria, and you have local stopping criteria. You can write something like this, but patch by patch, as we've seen before, prove you also local efficiency. And I've mentioned this, as this constant is independent of sigma bar and Q, you indeed have robustness with respect to nonlinearity. So, probably you're once again interested in what this can give in practice. So, just a quiet remark that, okay, which kind of englobing everything I've said so far. So, this is a framework which covers at once the most popular, most common numerical methods like conforming finite elements, non conforming finite elements, DGs, finite volumes, or mixed finite elements. In terms of discretization, in terms of linearization, what I've presented covers many methods, and in particular, the two most popular ones, fixed point or Picard and Newton, and in terms of linear solvers, completely independent of the linear solver. So any linear solver is covered. All assumptions needed for the theory are verified. So once again, some pictures, plots, graphs. This is always good, right? So we now have much more fancier Toy problem that the first one, it's not a Laplacian anymore. We are nonlinear. So this is this P Laplacian. This is the true solution. We've seen numerical experience with DG, with CG, with mix. So now it's time for non-conforming. So some numerical experience for non-conforming finite elements. So first of all, once again, the importance of understanding how the total error is decomposed into pieces. So I plot the error and estimator here and here, and I plot on my x axis the iteration of linear solver, which is here conjugate gradients. This is something which has been reported on one fixed mesh, some fixed level refined mesh, and on one fixed Newton step. So I'm trying to solve a linear algebra, and I observe what's going on in terms of linear algebra. Well, what's going on is the following thing. So repetition, it's like the graphs you've seen in DD. The total error goes a little bit down, then stagnates. Our estimate is greater than error, this is the blue curve. May makes the same thing, goes a little bit down, then stagnates. Why so? Well, because the <coughs> error, which is reported to us by estimators, has here three main components, linearization component, algebraic component, and discretization component. When you iterate linear algebra, structurally only the algebraic error goes down. This is very nicely seen here. If you continue beyond 35 iterations here, you can go up to 650 to satisfy a usual stopping criterion that linear algebra should be smaller than 10 to the minus 8. But you see nothing is going on with all the other curves here. So basically, this plot is just a little part here. See? Nothing, on is, nothing is going on from 35 to 650. Huh? Only the algebraic error goes down, but all the other curves, they just don't move. So 
That's why, practically, what we suggest, we've seen there's a lot of theoretical analysis which confirms, would give different theoretical results for this. The good idea is not to wait until the, in this case, algebraic error is very small. It's just enough when the algebraic error is not too big in comparison, say, with the total error, say, uh, 10 times, 3 times smaller than the total error. So you stop linear algebra after 35 iterations, and that's it. So this is our inner loop. OK, we can now see some pictures for the outer loop from my page 1. So this is the outer loop, iterative linearization by the Newton method. Once again, how does the total error behave? Goes down, stagnates. How does my uh, total estimator behave? Follows the error from above, stagnates. And how does the linearization component behave? Well, dominates the error at the beginning, and then decays slowly down. Typical stopping criteria, 10 to the minus 8. What we typically do, just stop when this linearization component stops to influence the rest. Okay? Well, I've now stopped my uh, out inner loop, the algebra, and out to loop, the linearization. And I once again come to my beloved question. Am I able to estimate where the error is distributed in space? So now the estimator is here on the left. This is what I predict for the distribution of the error. And the true error is on the right. See? Well, the pictures are looking quite similar. And this is not anymore a Laplace problem. This, this starts to be quite a nasty uh, stuff where there is everything. Uh, linearization error, algebraic error, discretization error. OK, these plots are basically to, to persuade you that this bold uh, blue statement is, is not just uh, you know, uh, something we claim without uh, evidence. So I typically compare what we are doing, black curve, so stopping adaptively, with what you obtain if you do the usual Newton method, red, and some engineering version in exact, oh sorry, blue is the exact, and some engineering stuff in exact Newton. So you see, in terms of number of Newton iterations per mesh refinement level, we are always the method which terminates first. In terms of uh, Newton iterations, uh, uh, no, no, sorry, in terms of uh, linear algebra, PCG iterations on each Newton step, we are adaptive. So when a couple of iterations are fine, three or five, if at some point we need to do more, like 50 we do more, we can do less. This is the full Newton method. We've seen it can go up to 650. The particular engineering approach I've picked here gives a fixed number of iterations of linear algebra on each Newton step, and this was, I think, 15 here. And the final plot should correspond to this. If you do Newton on each mesh refinement level, this is the total number of linear solver iterations. If you do an engineering approach, you cut it by a factor of five. And if you do uh, this mathematically supported approach, you cut another factor of five. So you do 25 times faster than the usual Newton algorithm. OK, this is to support the theoretical result of robustness. We switch from p equal to 10 that we had so far to p equal 1.5, and we see that the effectivity indices are still down below 1. So uh, it behaves in the same way in all the settings. That's the definition of robustness. And it also works well for singular problems, and this is my second numerical experiment here. So it's the same setting, P Laplacian, but once again, L-shaped domain, which means that the true solution is now also singular. Well, when the true solution is singular, you start to do the full uh, box of what this allows you to do. You do adaptive stopping of inner solver, adaptive stopping of outer solver, and you do adaptive mesh refinement, right? You just always do that part of your numerical simulation procedure, which generates the biggest component of the error. Once again, a plot taken somewhere inside of our procedure and showing you that whenever our stopping criteria is satisfied, everywhere inside the procedure, our estimated error distribution in the computational domain matches perfectly the true solution, the true error. Okay? 
Well, and these are some last two mathematical plots to once again persuade you that adaptivity is something not just very exciting for mathematics, but great for practice. If you do your favorite uniform mesh refinement, you can never uh, go in terms of degrees of freedom to a correct speed of the decrease of your error. If you do adaptivity, you typically obtain so. And second point, and this is particular to our approach, okay, you would be expecting that if you do adaptivity, that the price that you paid to get here would be still comparable to the price that you paid to get here. So the number of unknowns is the same here for adaptive version of mesh refinement and stopping criteria and uniform refinement. The number of unknowns is the same, so you would expect that you paid at about the same price to get here and to get here. The right plot, I always say this is a commercial, so the right plot actually tells us that not only in adaptivity, we have for the same number of unknowns, much better precision, but it tells us that we've paid much fewer number of total cumulated algebraic iterations than we paid to get here. So this is commercial, you achieve a better price, a better precision, and you pay less, right? So this is just great, I mean, come on. Every time you look on TV, they tell you, you know, uh, this works better and costs less. Yeah? So this is like uh, being on TV. Yeah? This is, this, but okay, it's serious mathematics, so these are, these are numbers. These are numbers, and per person, let me say so, the numbers here on the right, they are not in terms of CPU times, because this is always implementation dependent. So I always plot the total number of algebraic solver iterations. And then it depends how your stuff is implemented, uh, but this is a number which should be at about the same any computer you test. Okay, so time is running very fast. I've got three or four slides, so I'll go very rapidly through it and then I finish. Let's now take something finally that you're interested in, something fancy. In our group, we do porous media problems. You've got one example here. This is now a time-dependent PDE, you see DTE. This is a nonlinear PDE. This is a degenerate PDE. There is advection there. There are, in what I've written here, two PDEs coupled by a nonlinear algebraic constraints, so it's much far beyond what I've presented so far. Well, the next slide is to show you that still in this setting, we can achieve at about the same type of mathematical results. The distance of the approximate solution that you now obtain on each time step, on each linearization step, and on each algebraic step to the true solution can be upper bounded by fully computable estimators. These estimators can be cut into pieces. So now, spatial discretization, temporal discretization, linearization, and algebraic solver errors. And this, of course, allows you to design a fully adaptive algorithm. So you always stop the solvers when it's the time to stop them. You refine the mesh in space when it's time to do it. And you adjust the size of the time step to uh, not to overdo any part of your numerical algorithm. So I like to call it like online decisions, you know, this. Basically, uh, uh, the computer code which has these contributions is a manager. You know? uh, he, he kind of knows everything, well, how the group is working. You know? So he can manage the group. He can say, okay, um, you are done. Uh, you've done pretty well your job. Don't take our time. Uh, don't tell us, wait before I converge and we wait two days. Uh, just stop and, and let, let, let's let, uh, make another part of the procedure be working. So some graphs. Now, taking from the model problem I've shown you, once again, and the data, I should have also said this, the data are now uh, French Petroleum Institute data from some real uh, reservoir simulation. So the domain is not anymore one by one, but this is a couple of kilometers by a couple of kilometers, and the permeability is 10 to the minus 12. The condition number of the matrix was 10 to the, 10 to the power 13, so uh, something really nasty. You put everything into computer, and what you observe. Classically, you would stop in terms of linear algebra, GMRC here, because we know the total, total error in blue, all the components, we compare the components, and we say, OK, just stop the algebra here after 20 iterations. The same with linearization. Usually, you would rather wait to be more or less sure up to here. Well, we compare linearization with the other components and say, okay, just stop here. And then if you try to observe what does it 
do in terms of number here, number of GMRS iterations per time and linearization step. You see you cut them quite seriously down. And this is once again my final picture. The total number of cumulated GMRS iterations as the time progresses, how much did I pay to get to time two or to the final time? This is the usual setting. And this is what you obtain when you do adaptive stopping criteria. I think the speed up was something like 20 here. It's not changing the method, not making new algorithm, just analyzing how the method is going on and trying to manage to say, okay, that's fine, let's stop there. And of course, on top, you typically do mesh adaptivity, which allows you follow the front, refine around the source term. There is another source term here. Okay, I've got also some movie, but I did not put it there. Okay, so sorry, I uh, took some more time, but we made it. Uh, I've got these four conclusions. So apostry estimates is something which allows you to guarantee how big is the error in the numerical simulation. There are many of them, but if you work hard, you can achieve some, uh, I would say, uh, important and exceptional properties like robustness with respect to different parameters. We've seen that if you are able to cut the total error into pieces, then you can start to do full adaptivity. And what I always like to do, uh, like make a mathematical study which takes care at once of many different numerical methods, not to have to do one paper uh, for each numerical method, which is basically here. What we are working on, there are some other mathematical questions like convergence and optimality. I've only shown you lowest order time discretization, so that's a subject we treat with Jens Smears, who's with us now. Uh, uh, in Paris, and we started to do DD for nonlinear problems, and this is exactly what is inside this Apost DD project. Well, this is just a list of papers. So for Laplace and HP, algebraic error, inexact Newton, and these porous media flows. And by this, I thank you very much that you've been with me for this time, and hopefully uh, you maybe maybe you will maybe remember something out of it. Okay, thanks a lot.